Okay, good morning, everybody. Today we're going to talk about nail um, lesions. Make that go away. Um, and the good news is for the board examination, you're probably not going to get a lot of these. But you should know kind of some of the most important elements of it. And a lot of it's important just from a clinical perspective also. Um, just as a general rule of thumb, you know, dermatologists don't like to do nail biopsies. They're kind of complicated. Um, you got to get the patient in the clinic. You need to have a, put them on the tourniquet. You need a proper nail plate elevator. Uh, you know, they also are prone to cause scars if they're done right. You got to really get back into the matrix if you're worried about a neoplasm most of the time. So it's kind of an ordeal. And if a patient walks in your clinic with a nail disorder, you're not going to just say, okay, we're going to do a biopsy just like you do a shave biopsy for possible basal cell or something like that. It's, a, it's an ordeal. It takes, it takes time, energy, and, and expertise. So if a dermatologist do venture into doing nail biopsies, unfortunately, a lot of times the results are not that great. We get biopsies taken from the distal nail area. They do a punch biopsy, a pigmented lesion, and it's too distal. You've got to get into the matrix. Um, you know, punch biopsies, sometimes there's a two millimeter punch. Well, you, that may not be adequate because you need to be able to assess breadth, symmetry, circumscription, and biopsies of early melanoma, the nail unit, are extremely subtle. Sometimes you, you really, they don't, they don't look like classic melanomas elsewhere. We'll talk a little bit about that when we, when we actually show you an evolving melanoma, the nail unit. Um, and then, you know, sometimes people just, uh, you know, they, they take a shave biopsy, the nail unit or whatever, and that just, it's just prone to, to not getting a positive result. So it's a problem area and, you know, you really need to get somebody that's interested in it and do right types of biopsies and be prepared to, to really do them properly, especially when you're dealing with melanocytic lesions. And the other thing is in a melanocytic nail unit lesion, in my opinion, pretty much always should be accompanied by a clinical photograph. So, you know, there, there aren't that many of us that do a lot of these under the microscope. You really need good clinical correlation. Um, if somebody only does a one or two of these a year, they don't have clinical correlation, they're going to miss the diagnosis nine times out of 10. It's just a setup for medical legal issues. So this is not something for the faint of heart. You need to, to do it right. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, nail clippings. Um, a lot of times we get you know, clippings for diagnosis of onychomycosis and, and a dermat, you know, sometimes a dermatologist will send nail clippings and rule out melanoma or rule out of cancer. Well, a nail clipping is, is not even viable tissue anymore, obviously. It's keratin. And basically, you know, sometimes we'll look at a nail clipping. If it's got tiered parakeratosis with neutrophils in there, we'll suggest that it's psoriasis if the PAS is negative. But that's not as good as doing an actual biopsy of the viable epithelium, the nail unit. And you should never really ever rely on the diagnosis of the nail clipping for melanocytic lesion. If there's some melanin in there, you know, maybe we suggest it, but you know, there's some horror stories I've seen over the years of, of just small biopsies in the nail unit, nail clipping, rule out melanoma, and it just shows garbage and crust and, and it, it's not diagnostic melanoma. If the patient's got a big fun getting melanoma and lying there. So again, don't just be cavalier when dealing with the nail unit. You know, you, you need to, be thoughtful of it. You need to, if you're going to take a biopsy, make sure you're going to take a reasonable biopsy that encompasses the right area of the nail unit. And I would recommend that you study the nail unit normal anatomy um, if you're going to get into doing nail biopsies. One final pearl before you do a nail unit biopsy, if, if for a neoplasm, I would strongly recommend getting an x ray. Uh, Dick Scher, he was attending in, in NYU when I was a resident years ago. And that was one of the take home messages that he always drove home to us over and over again is that if you're going to do a biopsy of the nail unit, if there's nail dystrophy there, you're worried about a cancer, take a, an x ray first. There could be a bony abnormality underneath this that's really driving the abnormality you're seeing clinically. And you won't pick that up necessarily with a biopsy. So always do an x ray, see what's under there before you actually do the biopsy procedure itself. Now, the first one of these you can see, so this is the kind of stuff we usually get in the lab. We'll get maybe one or two pieces of tissue. This is actually one that had two pieces of tissue. Um, no, well, actually it, it does, but it's all, it was all in one bottle. And you see they did what I guess was probably a shave biopsy. The nail was dystrophic. Um, they got mostly some nail 
plate here with a little bit of nail bed epithelium. And that's, that's kind of typical of what we see if, if somebody does a shave biopsy of the nail unit. And uh, you can see it's got this verrucous epithelial hyperplasia here. So this probably was a bigger, deeper lesion. So we just got the surface of it. And uh, you can see that in the nail plate, it's got all these holes. And they're kind of oriented in this almost uh, horizontal parallel fashion to the nail plate. It's got some hemorrhage in here, you know, might have looked black or dark. And the most common cause of dark black discoloration of the nail unit nail plate is not melanoma by far. It's by it's nail trauma with hemorrhage in the nail plate. So, you know, they might have been worried about this being a melanoma and they took a shave of the lesion. The good news is they at least got some epithelium. Um, but it shows this very characteristic finding that's really diagnostic, if you will, of this entity. And this is known as an onychomatricoma. Now, we don't have clinical photographs here with this. I would strongly recommend that you Google onychomatricoma, look at the clinical photograph. And if you look at the uh, uh, kind of the end on, like you're looking down somebody's thumb and they've got an onychomatricoma, they get this large, thick uh, nail plate that's dystrophic and they get these little small frond-like structures papillary, 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 papillary like structures kind of forming these little holes uh, that you see peripherally. And when you do a biopsy of the nail plate, you see those holes, just like you see here. And notice that they're really at the edge, the, the end, the distalmost portion of the nail plate. So you can imagine this was a markedly thickened nail plate that's got these little holes in it. And if you go back proximal, you can see these little papillae here that uh, are giving rise to these little abnormal uh, cornification areas within the nail plate and that's markedly thickened. So it's called onychomatricoma. It's thought to be related to the matrical epithelium of the nail um, forming apparatus. So the matrix, nail matrix is analogous to the matrix of the hair uh, follicle. So like we have pilomatricoma. Well, here we have, instead of pilo, we have onychomatricoma. So it's not exactly analogous to pilomatricoma. This thing looks almost more like a, a warty lesion with matrical differentiation. So you can see this sort of primitive uh, stem cell matrix-like cells here that are involved in the formation of this papillary structure with these dilated blood vessels. So it's, it's an interesting name. I think it's a reasonable name. It sort of looks like a wart, but it's got this matrical component. And instead of having coralocytic change features that, that you can see that look like a wart, um, it's got this matrical uh, epithelium, usually kind of at the base of these little papillary frond-like structures. So that's one that they could ask you on the exam because it's kind of interesting. Um, it's pretty distinctive. It gives you these holes in the, um, the nail plate. So when you see a lot of holes that are elongated sort of uh, in parallel with the nail plate itself, you should think of onychomatricoma. And then if you see the epithelium like you see here uh, in this area down here, you can make the diagnosis with certainty. So the difference of diagnosis would include a wart but this warts don't have the matrical elements to them and they have coralocytic change. I, don't, I would doubt, they might, but I doubt if they would show you this with a differential diagnosis of a wart, they might put something like squamous cell or something like that. That's, that's obviously not that. So it's an interesting lesion. Just remember, uh, basically you're dealing, that's, that's uh, onico uh, matricoma. And this is another, okay, so we had two slides on that lesion. This is the uh, an area that's a little bit more proximal to that. And you can see this is kind of this reticulated, uh, unusual morphology of the epithelium and back in the nail matrix area. And then here you can see some of that matrical-like uh, proliferation up here. It's got this verrucous matrical kind of component that uh, is giving you those changes that we saw in the nail plate on the other slide. And uh, you know, these are, are not exactly shadow cells, but they're, they're kind of analogous. I, I guess maybe they are shadow cells. So I, I'd say that they're sort of analogous to shadow cells that we see in a pilometricoma. Relatively uncommon to see this, actually. This is a little bit interesting that it's present in this, in this specimen, but you can see why the analogy to pilometricoma is there, where you get the shadow cells formed by the matrical cells of the nail unit versus the matrical cells of the hair follicle. Uh, so it's the same kind of analogous condition, if you will. Okay, let's look at the next case. All right, so the most common by far uh, biopsies that we get uh, of the nail unit is where we get rule out fungal infections of the nail unit. And, you know, by, the most common is obviously just good old fashioned onychomycosis. The most common thing we see there is a 
uh, a clipping of the nail. And when we get a nail clipping in the lab, we will do a PAS stain in search of hyphal elements. Um, if we see hyphae in the nail plate, that strongly favors the diagnosis of onychomycosis. You can either get both gamadiaceous, non uh, dermatophyte mold uh, infections of the nail plate that actually cause bona fide infections in some cases, or they can be contaminants and just kind of overgrow the area. And there may be a dermatophyte that gets a secondary overgrowth of the, uh, of the, of the non dermatophyte infection. And then sometimes you'll actually see candida. This is purportedly a candidal uh, nail unit infection here. Let me see if I can find some areas of that. And candidiasis is, is usually relatively uncommon to actually cause a true uh, nail plate infection. Usually it causes a paronychia, and uh, there may be a couple of hyphal elements in here. There may be some yeast and, and some hyphae here in the nail plate. So in this case, uh, this was an example of a candidal nail plate infection. Here you can see some of the actual yeasts of the candida here involving the nail unit. Now, I don't know if this was really real or if this was basically uh, it, this actually may have been kind of a combination of candida plus dermatophyte when you get this kind of these hyphal elements here, but you can get candida in here and that doesn't actually end up causing the infection. So here you can see one of these yeast here that's actually budding in the nail plate. So that's pretty uncommon. Most of the time we just see yeast and uh, you do a culture, the yeast may grow out. You don't actually see any hyphae. Here we've got these pseudo hyphae that are forming here in the nail plate. So maybe it actually is causing an infection. And then in a couple other areas, it's got some you know, organisms that might be, uh, might be a dermatophyte. So you know, it's possible this was a mixed infection. It might've even had some dermatiaceous uh, contaminant. This almost looks like maybe a uh, uh, alternary or something like that that may be costing it. So again, normally we just get in a, in a classic case, we'll see pretty much obvious um, dermatophyte infection. In some cases, we'll see yeast like we see here that may be causing a true infection, and then sometimes we'll get a mixture. So uh, again, we think of the nail unit as, as these infections coming in sort of like tinea pedis or tinea capitis, but uh, it's not uncommon in the nail unit to get both the matiaceous candida, which may be just commensal, and then you can get a true dermatophyte there as well. So just remember that that's, that's going on here. Here, the, I think the main teaching point here is that we had all this candida that uh, probably, in this case, given how much of this is, and the fact that you've got some actual candidal organisms that are, that are germinating, it's probably a true candidal nail uh, infection, which is relatively uncommon. Usually it's a paronychia that we see. Okay, so the next case, again, this is a nail plate, and it's a PAS stain, and uh, the PAS stain here is negative, but I do want to point out that basically you've got kind of this yellowish discoloration in the nail plate. Usually it's even more yellow than we see here, and most of the time we get a yellow nail plate with an H and E, even not even with a PAS. It's a sign that you're dealing with pseudomonas infection. And uh, you may or may not actually see the bacteria. So this isn't as good an example as, as, as we could get. Uh, but normally in a, in a pseudo uh, lesion of the nail plate infection, um, you'll see a lemon yellow color. So this, I'm not gonna spend much more time on this one because it really doesn't show it very well. This, this one's maybe a little bit better. Um, yeah, this, this is what you wanna see. So lemon yellow in a nail plate, it's due to the pyocyanin green color that you see clinically. So you see that green color uh, in the clinical case when you actually take it and, and then do a, PA, do a regular stain, H&E, or even a PAS stain, it has this lemon yellow color to it. And you, you may or may not see any bacteria. So uh, here we may have a, maybe there's some bacteria up here. Um, hard to tell, there's no hyphal elements, so we know it's not a fungal infection but it's got uh, this lemon yellow color. And so that's the teaching point here is when you see this yellow discoloration of the nail plate, you should be thinking of a, uh, uh, of, of a pseudomonas infection. So we'll look at it one more time here. So again, this is the pyocyanin, the green color you see clinically, looks lemon yellow under the microscope and you may or may not see any bacteria. So even though uh, you know, it's green and it's yellow and it looks like there should be bacteria. You don't really have to have very many to get the release of the chemicals that causes discoloration. 
And, you know, if you did a culture, you'd probably grow out pseudomonas. If you did enough sections, you might find a little focus of pseudomonas infection in there somewhere. Um, but still, just the main thing to remember is this, is this lemon yellow color equals pseudomonas. Uh, again, not sure they'd ask you that on the exam, uh, but they might. Okay. Here's another example. So we get a nail dystrophic change. Patients comes in with this, this ugly, funky looking nail. It's crusting. Obviously looks like something's going on. You know, your first differential diagnosis might be a fungal infection. Uh, but you should always remember that when something looks like a fungus, there are a lot of other things that can cause nail dystrophy that aren't fungus. And you should always be thinking about those in your differential diagnosis. So uh, it can be a neoplastic process, it can be an inflammatory process. We see pemphigus involving the nail unit. We see lichen planus involving the nail unit. We see squamous cell involving the nail unit. We see malignant melanoma involving the nail unit. And all of those can produce a dystrophic, ugly looking nail. And so when you're treating a patient with presumed diagnosed of onychomycosis, maybe you've done a nail clipping and it's negative, but you say, well, I really still think this guy's got onychomycosis. Don't give it too much longer um, to keep treating. You know, the old definition of insanity that Einstein coined years ago, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Don't just treat patients forever with Lamisil or, or a, a Azole or whatever drug you're using, Griseofulvin. Um, if it's not getting better, you need to back off and say, wait a minute, why isn't this getting better? And then maybe do an x-ray then, like I said before, maybe do a biopsy of the nail unit to make sure you're not missing squamous cell, make sure you're not missing a melanoma. And I've seen many cases over the years that turn into lawsuits in some cases where someone started treating someone with pheronychomycosis. Um, they maybe did a clipping and it was negative, but they didn't trust the diagnosis. They just thought maybe it was artifactually negative, which they are artifactually negative in a, in a significant you know, percentage of cases. Um, and then they kept treating. And then finally, someone else took a biopsy of the nail unit. And lo and behold, there was a squamous cell there or a melanoma. And then they went back and sued the original doctor for not making a diagnosis, just kind of treating presumptively. So you treat presumptively for a while and get away with it. But if it doesn't get better within a, the window of reasonability, um, then you're considered negligent. So don't just, you know, treat something forever and ever and hope that it gets better. And when it doesn't, then say, well, you know, obviously maybe the, the treatment's not working because the patient's not taking it or something like that. You need to go back and ask if the diagnosis is incorrect. So here we've got, you know, they probably thought this was on, on a mycosis. They actually took a biopsy here and they actually got into some epithelium. And lo and behold, it looks like this verrucous epithelial hyperplasia it's got uh, some dilated blood vessels here, and it's got some coilocytic change. So this is an example here of a subungual verruca. And so, um, you know, the other thing about neoplasms in the nail unit is that they can become secondarily infected with fungus also. So if you've got a squamous cell of your nail unit, and, you know, your nail uh, unit uh, integrity is no longer what it should be, well, guess what? You know, fungus can come in there and set up shop, uh, even though it's a neoplasm that's underlying there. Just like it can on the, on the mucous membranes of the mouth or, or the palate. You can have squamous cell carcinoma. They get secondary infected with Canada or all uh, bacteria, all, all sorts of things. So you know, don't just assume if you see fungus that that means that they've got a fungal infection. Also, even though the, the fungal stain or whatever might be positive, you want to make 100% sure that you're not missing something like a, a ward or a squamous cell or something like that that's underlying it. So in this case, they, uh, again, notice they didn't take a deep giant incisional biopsy. They took a shave biopsy here, and they still got deep enough to, to make a diagnosis, thank goodness. But uh, if this was a verrucous carcinoma of the nail unit, it, it would not exclude that. Because if you look at the surface of a verrucous carcinoma, which are caused by human papillomavirus in, in the majority of cases, um, it's going to look like a ward at the top. But the diagnosis is made because it extends so deeply. It goes into the bone. So once again, if you're going to diagnose verrucous carcinoma, think in terms of using an imaging study. And if you're really gonna make a histologic diagnosis, you can't make it on a shave biopsy. You really need something that's gonna take an incisional biopsy that really allows us to look to see how deep it goes. But this was an example of a subungual verruca that caused this uh, nail dystrophy that uh, ended up causing the uh, clinician that to ultimately take a biopsy of it. So again, uh, PA, we always do PAS stains in our laboratory of any nail unit biopsy just to see if there's fungus that's in there. In this case, it happened to be negative, but even if it was positive, they still have this verrucous lesion underlying it. So 
couple of take-home messages here. Remember to take a shave biopsy or a deep shave saucerization biopsy. And if you suspect verrucous carcinoma, x-ray imaging study, and you may need an incisional biopsy. And just because it shows the diagnosis of a wart, it doesn't mean it can't be a verrucous carcinoma in the proper setting. So those are just a couple of things to, to remember about that. Okay, this, again, nail clipping. So this is not a, uh, they didn't take a punch, they didn't take a shave, they didn't get any epithelium at all. So this is purely a clipping of the nail unit. And uh, they submitted this to rule out uh, onychomycosis. As you can imagine, that's you know 99% of the time, that's what we get the nail clippings for. And notice here, it shows these alternating areas of parakeratosis with neutrophils in this, this tiered parakeratosis. Neutrophils at the, at the tips of these little summits of parakeratosis. So this is a nice example of nail unit psoriasis, clipping of the nail unit, where we were able to make a diagnosis, presumptive diagnosis of psoriasis based just on the nail clipping. So if you see a patient that comes in with an oil drop sign of their nail, or they got the nail um, pits and you do a clipping of that, this is what it looks like. So we would definitely do a PAS stain here also. And if the PAS is negative and it shows this finding, it really favors psoriasis. Um, you really should correlate this with the clinical appearance of the patient. So again, if you just look at the na one nail of psoriasis, it can look very much like um, onychomycosis. So if they've got lots of nails involved and they've got pitting and they've got psoriasis elsewhere and you get the nail clipping that shows this, well, then you can say, well, it tends to confirm the diagnosis of psoriasis. But we'd be reluctant to make a definitive diagnosis of psoriasis just on the basis of a nail clipping that shows these changes alone. It really needs to be correlated with the rest of the patient. Um, and again, you can get false negative PAS stains. When fungus grows into the nail, um, it's not like putting a drop of uh, food coloring in your swimming pool and it diffuses uh, nice and homogeneously throughout the entire thing. Uh, basically, fungus doesn't grow like that. It may be positive in one area and then it may be negative in another area and it, it's not growing like a, a you know, totally uh, symmetrical fashion. It, it may be able to grow more positively in, in one area and not in another area for one reason or another. And there's lots of different uh, clinical forms of onychomycosis. There's superficial wide onychomycosis, where it kind of grows from the outside in. There's distal onychomycosis, there's proximal onychomycosis. So it, it can affect the nail unit a lot of different ways, and it can cause nail dystrophy distal to where the actual fungus is living. So you do a nail clipping in the distal part of the nail that's abnormal, it may be falsely negative. So you really need to get back to where the interface is between where the fungus is growing and the nail dystrophy is developing if you want to get the highest yield. And that means clipping the nail back, getting rid of all the negative debris, and then getting that sort of area right where the, the fungus is really actively growing to get the highest yield for a PAS stain. And certainly if you're going to do a culture, that's the best place to, to actually uh, take your sample from. And uh, you know, patients don't like it when you clip their nails, but that's what you really need to do uh, to debride the area if you're going to really get the best possible chance of making a diagnosis. But here, we've got an example of nail unit psoriasis. So we see something like this with a negative PAS stain that would favor psoriasis. But once again, you know, you can have a significant percentage of cases where the, the uh, uh, PAS stain can be negative, yet they really and truly still have fungal infection. And of course, the opposite is true too. Um, it can be negative because it's really negative and they've got cancer or something like that too. So take the PAS stains with a grain of salt when they're positive and clinically they've got nail dystrophy. Uh, all systems seem to, to fit, you know, go to that clinical correlation. You can make a definitive diagnosis treat the patient accordingly. Uh, but if it doesn't respond to therapy, even if it's positive, pull back and say, is there possibly something superimposed here on this, why it's not responsive to therapy? Okay, this uh, is not the nail itself. This is a periungual lesion. And there really are kind of, I'd say there are three common periungual lesions you really kind of need to know about. The first one is tuber sclerosis, where you get an angiofibroma of the nail unit. And the board loves tuber sclerosis, so they're going to ask you questions about that. You can just go ahead and expect it. So go ahead and learn the genetic uh, abnormality, the, the tuber and gene, and what that causes, and all the clinical manifestations, chagrin patch, the, the crow sign. You, know, you need to know, know everything there is to know about tuber sclerosis. And so this is the periangle fibroma, the angiofibroma, Keenan Kernan tumor is really, I guess, the way you would say that. And you can see it, it looks almost like a wart, but it's got all these dilated blood vessels and fibroplasia. So that's 
and notice these stellate fibroblasts here. So this is sort of almost looks like what you would see with the fibrous papula, one of the adenoma sebaceum-like lesions around the face. If you biopsy one of those, it looks identical to this, only this is occurring around the finger. And it's periungual. So it's not actually in the nail bed. It's not uh, affecting the nail plate. It's affecting the area to the side. And they kind of look like little uh, garlic cloves uh, clinically. So when you see that, they might show you a picture of that clinically and then show you this biopsy and say, what's the most likely diagnosis? Or what's the genetic abnormality associated with a syndrome and expect you to be able to, to pick that up pretty quickly. And so remember that it's basically an angiofibroma that looks just like the adenosebaceum, like adeno, uh, and angiofibromas present on the face of those patients. And that's obviously not uh, adenoma at all. It's not acne, it's nothing. It's basically fibrous papula-like lesions and angiofibromas in that area. The two other lesions that you really need to know that look like this is acquired digital fibrokeratoma. Those can occur adjacent to the nail bed, nail unit area too on occasion. Usually they're not exactly in the same location as the uh, 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 angiofibromas of, of TS. Usually they're kind of to the side or on the, on the edge of the palm, you know, something like that. So they look in a slightly different location. Um, you can sometimes see the uh, accessory digit which is basically a traumatic neuroma when those little mini digits that form in children get amputated in utero and you get that little uh, traumatic neuroma papule. So that's another interesting the differential diagnosis. Uh, an acquired digital fiber keratoma, it does not show these dilated blood vessels like this. It basically just shows this diffuse, thick collagen with fibroblasts, but usually don't get the blood vessels like you see here in acquired digital fiber keratoma. And then the last one is just a periodal verruca. And there you get more epithelial involvement. You don't get the stellate fibroblasts and the angiofibroma-like features like you see here most of the time in a, in a wart. Uh, you, can, you can get a little bit of angiofibroma-like change sometimes, but not generally to the degree here. And obviously you get more acanthosis with the coilocytic change. So those are the probably three or four most common differential diagnostic entities that kind of occur in a periungual location that are neoplastic that are benign. So you should know the difference between, between all of those. Now this is not from the nail unit, um, but this is a lesion that is seen very common in the nail unit. We just decided to kind of show you this because it's the same tumor, but this actually was occurring on the glabrous skin. This is a glomus tumor. And a glomus tumor is one of the painful tumors. Uh, they're always painful in the nail unit because that's an area where there are a lot of nerves and things that develop any neoplasm that occurs in the nail unit can be painful just because there are a lot of nerves there. And anytime you, you know, hit your finger when you're hammering a nail and obviously you know how painful that is. Well, when you get a tumor down there, it's obviously painful as well. And this is uh, an example of a vascular lesion that's comprised of the very classic glomus cells. These are very small, round, homogeneous, very monomorphous in their morphology. They're usually present right adjacent to the lumen of a blood vessel, like you see here. Uh, these cells stain positively with stains for actin. They contain myofibrils uh, within them. They're not myofibroblasts, but they have myofibrils in there. They're actin because basically the way the glomus body works is it helps to shut the blood in and out of your blood vessels and your fingers. So when your hands get cold, uh, the blood goes out of your acral part of your body into the central part of your body, your brain to keep your core body temperature normal so you don't get hypothermic. Uh, so it's a, a very useful thing to have, but occasionally they turn into little benign neoplasms like we see here. And uh, the diagnosis is made on the basis of the fact that you get all these large little small clones of cells that look very homogeneous. And you can see that they arise directly from the periphery of one of these uh, blood vessels here. And uh, glomangioma, generally looks like this, but it has more large ectatic blood vessels and fewer of the glomus cells. When there's a solitary glomus tumor in the nail unit, they tend to be more like this. So this is, even though it's not from the nail unit, it looks more like a glomus tumor that would occur in the nail unit because there's a lot more cells per unit area. And the best stain to do for this, again, is an actin stain. You're, you're looking at the, the actin that's within the cells that's used to cause these blood vessels to constrict. And that's why that's how that works. So you have to ha actually have these actin myofibrils to make those blood vessels constrict and shut the blood uh, from there. And people that have Raynaud's disease, uh, these are very, they're overly active glomus cells in a way. That's, that's a way to think about that. So when you get that white discoloration in a person with Raynaud's and cold, those uh, blood vessels shut and they stay closed. And that's why the skin gets white and cold and looks the way it does.
Okay, we show a couple of uh, moving to neoplasms again. So this is a biopsy again taken from the nail unit and, and it's sort of a typical nail unit biopsy. It's all fragmented and, and uh, we get mostly nail unit uh, cornified layer material up here and kind of have to look around and really find any evidence of any epithelium. And lo and behold, we have this small little fragment of nail, probably bed epithelium. And you can see that it's got this markedly atypical keratinocytic proliferation that's extending through the full thickness of the epithelium to the base of the specimen. So this is an example of a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, at least in the specimen. I'm not sure it may actually extend more deeply, but here it looks like more squamous cell carcinoma in situ. And notice that overlying the cancer is this perikeratosis with these uh, areas of some hemorrhage in there and some serum. Here's some hemorrhage over here. So this might have looked dark, might have been black. The nail was probably dystrophic because it's got all this perikeratosis. And so they may well have thought this was an example possibly of, uh, they might have sent it as rule out melanoma. They might have sent it in as possibly a wart. They might have sent it in as onychomycosis. And here's the nail plate. And notice that it's not normal. It's got this perikeratosis and some crust in it. So if you just had a nail clipping from this, this is all we had, you wouldn't be able to make the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. You would be thinking, okay, well, maybe it's just a nail clipping of possible onychomycosis and we did a PAS statement that was negative. And a uh, you know, clinician might go ahead and treat for another three or four months on the basis of this. But if you just had something like this with the nail clipping, no, you're out of luck. You know, There's no way you can make a diagnosis of squamous cell on something like this. So just, uh, it does have this perikeratosis more diffuse. It's got this crust. I mean, this is probably the malignant dyskeratosis overlying the cancer, but you can't make that diagnosis just on a nail plate. And if you just had this area up here, this kind of looks like, uh, almost like a callus, maybe the surface of a wart. No atypical keratinocytic proliferation here either. So this almost looks like HPV. And, and warts, HPV, uh, we all know they can have oncogenic uh, strains and in the nail unit, many of these are precipitated by HPV infection. We just have this one little area, we've got crust of the nail plate, we've got an area that's got some epithelium, looks like a wart, and this little teensy tiny area where we make the diagnosis of squamous cell. So this is a real world scenario that we see. Uh, the good news is it's not super common, but it's not vanishingly rare, and it's common enough that you can end up in a court house over something like this. So just make sure that if it doesn't respond to uh, appropriate therapy in a reasonable period of time, take a biopsy, make sure you're looking uh, for this that may be underlying the area. So this is another area of the squamous cell carcinoma here. So um, hopefully I've driven that home point, that point home well enough for you and just realize that when you're taking a nail unit biopsy, you can't just take a little clipping and expect to get a diagnosis. You gotta bite the bullet. You gotta take a real biopsy. This was close to a real biopsy. At least they got enough tissue that really allowed them to make the diagnosis. But sometimes you have to just go in and, you know, take the nail, revulse the nail, do like a deep saucerization biopsy or an incisional biopsy or a punch biopsy and submit that to us and submit it with a photograph and an x-ray. So that's the best way to deal with a nail uh, neoplasm. Here's another example, different case. Um, and again, they took uh, a biopsy of the nail bed here. So this guy, I think, may not have really, doesn't really have much of a nail plate anymore. So he may have had this just dystrophic nail bed. The nail plate may have been destroyed. And this almost, as you can see, looks like skin. I mean, this may have been the distal part of the nail bed with the very distal uh, hyponychium that's residual up here. And this shows squamous cell carcinoma in situ. So this is a different case than what we had before. But you can see that it, uh, in this case, they were able to make a diagnosis. And this, this really was involving the distal part of the nail. So this can still give you um, nail dystrophy, can, can result in destruction of the, the nail plate. Uh, the, if you get cancer underlying your nail plate, well, it's not going to adhere anymore. And eventually it's not going to grow normally. And so always think of cancers as causing nail unit abnormalities, nail dystrophy that can simulate other things. So in this case, they're able to make a diagnosis with a deep saucerization biopsy of the distal part of the nail unit, which is fine. You don't always have to go back in the matrix. You know, this lesion probably arose maybe from an HPV infection or 
these are usually not sun-induced cancers like uh, carcinomas of the face and things like that. These are usually induced by some other thing. Maybe the guy was an x-ray technician, used to leave his hand while the x-rays were being given. And we've actually seen that before where uh, squamous or carcinoma of the nail unit develops and, and x-ray technicians that don't, they maybe put a, a lead shield on their body, but they say, hey, I'm going to hold the plate in, in, uh, in the right place while we're getting the x-ray. And they do that over many years and they're getting a cancer. So there are other reasons for that. But uh, that's an example of a squamous cell carcinoma developing in the distal part of the nail unit. Uh, and the, that diagnosis was made with, with relative ease in that situation. Now, the last thing I want to show, about, uh, show you are nail pigmented lesions. And, and this is another one where you really have to get a good biopsy. And, and I just strongly encourage you to uh, take a photograph of this. You can't do a nail clipping here. Somebody's got a pigmented unit in the nail and you need to take a nail biopsy. If you don't feel comfortable with it, send it to a Mohs surgeon or somebody that's used to doing these and they're set up to do surgery and, and they're, they're glad to get these. You know, they love them. If you don't love them, don't do it. Get them out of your practice. Let somebody else do it. Uh, but if you're going to do it and it's interesting and fun to do, you just have to be willing to take the time and be prepared and uh, understand the, the technology for doing it. And there's, there's really two ways of, of doing it. You, you really have to... Um, get into the nail matrix to make the diagnosis of pigmented lesion in the nail unit. You have to do that. And uh, one way of doing it is to do a couple of little incisions at the edge of the, these, the nail area, and then you reflect back the proximal nail fold, and then you go into the matrix underneath there and take either a deep saucerization biopsy or a punch biopsy. And if it's a nail unit pigmented lesion, I recommend that you punch up as much of the thing as you possibly can. If you take a, a two millimeter punch or three millimeter punch, out of a broad nail unit lesion, you're gonna see something in a minute I'll show you that is not necessarily diagnostic. So you really need to take something that's gonna be representative of the air if you're gonna do a punch. Another thing you can do is kind of a, a kind of like a little saucerization where you kind of go in and do a, like a shave excision and, and you can take out sort of an on block piece of tissue that may be something sort of like what they did here. And uh, you can see that it just shows the uh, heavily pigmented cells at the basal cell layer of the matrix. This is the nail matrix, so that's the area that you really need to sample. And uh, that's a perfectly legitimate technique as well. Then you reflect back the proximal nail fold, and then you put sutures in those areas, and then you let the nail plate grow in. And that will produce a thin nail. It will produce a, uh, a, a central uh, deformity of the nail when you do that, the nail plate. So that's another technique that's really quite good. And, and I recommend that you get familiar with that if you're gonna do nail unit biopsies. And this is a classic example of nail unit lentigo, lentigo simplex. And notice that there's, there's no uh, vacuolization around the individual melanocytes. These are dendritic melanocytes and they're situated mostly at the basal cell layer of the, of the nail matrix. There's no patchoid spread. And generally in nail unit melanoma, unless it's, uh, pretty florid, you may not see patch tree spread. The earliest sign of nail unit melanoma, and I'll talk about in a minute, is where you get extensively long dendrites that extend throughout the epithelium all the way to the top, bottom to the top, not just from the bottom to like about here, like we see in the nail unit lenigo, but they go from the bottom all the way to the top over a broad front. And they're often somewhat asymmetrical also. You may say, well, this one goes to the top, this one doesn't, this one does, this one doesn't. Those are things that you look for. And usually they're thick and fat dendrites not thin, delicate dendrites like we see here, thick and fat dendrites. And also when you're looking at nail unit lesions, now I'm, I'm not a big uh, advocate of doing a lot of extra special stains. I believe in trying to keep the cost of medicine as low as we possibly can. So I don't believe in doing a lot of extraneous extra stains. I've, that's been just a mantra of mine for many years. But in the nail unit, you almost have to do stains to evaluate the degree of uh, these dendrites and, and looking use like S100 protein in socks tend to see in some cases the number of melanocytes there because the number of melanocytes can be deceivingly low yet the patient really has a melanoma and we'll talk about that in a minute but sometimes the nail unit melanomas can be very subtle they can look a lot worse clinically than they do histologically so this again is a situation where we really need to be correlating clinical with histology if you get a Hutchinson sign um, that's a very strong indication for dealing with a melanoma. And histologically, it may look pretty subtle. Sometimes it can look kind of like this uh, when you're dealing with an early moiety melanoma in the nail unit. But this is a classic example of nail unit lenigo. So let's take a look at our last case, which is a nail unit malignant melanoma. And they did an incisional uh, 
longitudinal nail biopsy here. So this is great. This is, this is really what you want to see. And when you're processing the tissue, you need to put in the nail plate because if you've ever separated your nail in some way and traumatically or whatever, the reason it hurts so much is because it rips off some of the epithelium that stays on the bottom of the nail plate itself. And sometimes that's where the most of the epithelium is. And sometimes that's where most of the melanoma is. It may be in this epithelium that's adhering to the bottom of the nail plate. And notice here, it's hard to appreciate, but there's melanin here in the nail plate. Normally your nail plate doesn't have any cells in it at all. It's just flat keratin. Well, here you've got these little melanocytes and melanin that have been transepidermally, this is analogous to pagetoid spread. So these melanocytes have gone into the nail plate itself. That's not normal. That's a clue that you're dealing with the nail plate overlying a melanoma when you see this, especially when you have this many. If you just have a few and they're in, in a column and it's melanin, well, that doesn't mean melanoma, but when you get a lot of these over a broad front like this, that's a red flag. So if we saw this, we'd be concerned about that, even though we may not be able to see any more anesthetic neoplasia. And then, of course, you want to look into the epithelium. So notice here, it's pretty subtle. I mean, I don't see much of anything. I could call melanoma here. Maybe that's a melanocyte, but maybe not. I'm not sure. So when you get something like this, we're going to look at all of the, the, the pieces. We're going to look to see, and we're going to look especially at this piece where there's actually, this is probably the proximal nail fold, where there's actually the Hutchinson sign. And then when you look up here, you can see a very subtle proliferation of these single cells here. Notice how subtle this is. That's a melanocyte. That's a melanocyte. There's a dendrite of the melanocyte right here. Here's another example. These, these are melanocytes. So these are single melanocyte proliferation. So look how subtle this is. This is melanoma. If you don't get this at this stage of the game and the patient gets into a nodular melanoma later on, you know, that can be, be very uh, obviously dangerous, kill the patient. It's, it's not a good situation. This is what happens when you see a melanoma in an early stage. And there may be another area, if we can find it, where we see those prominent dendrites. So notice here, look at all this melanin up here. That is a, a very, that's a huge red flag. And here you can see some heavily pigmented uh, areas up here. These are some melanocytes here. They're very atypical. But notice that, that we're just barely kind of into this. We're, we're, we're just at the level of the epithelium. We're not even beneath the epithelium in this part of the specimen over here. We have some sub, uh, you know, sub uh, non-epithelial tissue over here. We really don't have any over here. And we really like to see that. So again, this is, you can imagine the anatomy. This is the proximal nail fold. So this is the outside world. Here it's kind of dipping underneath. Here's where the nail is being formed at the matrical area. We'd like to see what's going on down here. And we really don't have that in this case. So unfortunately, in this case, we, we would like to see another area and we didn't really get it. So if we would have had that area, chances are we would have seen more obvious features of, of melanoma. But when you see early melanoma in the nail unit area, you may just see these elongated dendrites that extend throughout the epithelium. We're not seeing that here in this example, but if you get early malignant melanoma of the nail unit melanoma in situ, that's what you see. So this is an example of a, a nail unit melanoma that um, maybe over here we can see a little bit more of that. Here you can see in this little area here, there's some heavily pigmented melanocytes. So notice these large, thick, now here's a good example. Big fat dendrite going all the way through the epithelium right here. That's totally abnormal. When you see something like that, you need to say, wow, you know, this, even though it doesn't look like an obvious thick nodular ugly malignant melanoma here in this specimen, because we, you know, don't know what's going on down here. This is diagnostic of melanoma when I see something like this. And uh, then couple that with, with these other areas with this irregular melanin that's being extruded into the nail plate. Um, these large, ugly dendritic melanocytes here that vary in size and shape and coalesce. Malignant melanoma, okay, the nail unit. And this has a different type of genetic abnormality than melanoma of, uh, of other parts of the body. So again, I would strongly recommend you learn about that, the GNAQ mutation. These things are really more like melanomas of the eye, mucous membrane melanomas, uh, and they don't have a good prognosis if they're left alone and, and the patient ultimately gets a nodular or lesion. Uh, it can be a tragedy and, and patients can die from this. I had a good friend of mine a few years ago die of a amelanotic uh, melanoma in the male unit that he thought was a, uh, he didn't know what it was and actually had it diagnosed at a primary care-like uh, setting and outpatient uh, non-dermatology offices of pyogenic granuloma, and he let it sit there until filing tasks size and ultimately 
resulted in his uh, untimely death. So um, just remember, uh, have a high degree of respect for nail unit pathology. Uh, don't, and, and the biggest pitfall uh, I see is either not taking adequate biopsies or taking a biopsy at all, assuming the diagnosis um, is uh, onychomycosis and just treating and treating and treating and treating when it's not onychomycosis, missing the diagnosis when they call neoplasm. Those are all things to remember when you're dealing with uh, nail unit lesions. And always remember to take an x-ray before you take a biopsy. So uh, thanks again for your attention. Uh, we've got another session uh, coming up next week. I'm not sure what the topic is, but uh, uh, this is an important one. And, and we didn't really deal today much with inflammatory lesions of the nail unit, like lichen planus and pemphigus and uh, other things like that. So that's another, uh, even though we didn't cover that today, that's something you need to know. And I strongly recommend that you uh, learn that on your own in addition to what we talked about today. So thanks again for your time and your attention, and we will see you next week.